Welcome back to Day Talk, fellow talkers. And on this very episode, we're going to talk about the craziest murder that I have heard that has taken place in Finland. This one happened back in 1998 in city of Hyvinkä in Uusimaa. This one includes Satanism, metal music and mutilations. But before we go into those horrific topics and details, let's welcome back our co-host from Strike the Truth blog, Miss Alexandra. Hello, Top Bunny. Nice to talk about again another gruesome murder from Huvinka, which is so surprising for such a small town. This one is definitely one of the worst ones that I have heard. And this is the kind of a murder and crime that gives a bad name to all of us metal fans. Yeah, unfortunately, I guess it happened at the height of the satanic panic, didn't it? Yeah, actually, it did. And uh, back in the previous episodes, Dylan and I were talking about this satanic panic in Finland. You should go and check it out if you haven't uh, after this episode, of course. And it's pretty weird that this one actually took place on the end of the 90s when this satanic panic was going on in Finland. And and I don't know if it was something that might have triggered these people to show off a bit more to their dark side or or what. But I can assure you that when I was part of these metal groups, uh, city nearby Hyvinkää on those times, we did not have anything like this going on well you know some people they enjoy the music and the crowd and the kind of lifestyle and then some people take everything very literally and they go off the deep end so i would say that in this particular case from what i've heard these people also had some other issues that contributed to the reason why they murdered it wasn't just the music or their beliefs yeah so let's start the talk but before that leave us a like we are struggling with this youtube algorithm and all the likes comments subscriptions and notification bell hits would help our channel with its visibility so please do all of those things and leave comments if you know anything of such cases from your own country, or if you are from Hyvinkää or Finland in general, please tell us what you remember or think about this specific subject. But yeah, let's go back in time to 1998 and the city of Hyvinkää. And more specifically, Tuesday 24th of November 1998 when this poor guy who was dumping his garbage on the uh, waste managed facility in Kapula near Hyvinkä happened to found a severed leg. Yeah, now that you mention it, you know, it's quite common for people to find bodies at dumps. Maybe not in Finland, but certainly in the USA, for example. There are several famous cases that started this way. Uh, that's true, and serial killers have been known to dump their corpses all over the counties and even even uh, waste and manage facilities. But of course, this uh, guy who found this leg uh, notified the officials immediately, and the police was all over the case. The coroner could estimate in these early stages of the investigation that the leg belonged to 20 to 60 year old, probably male, but couldn't really nail it down specifically. Also, they determined that the leg was cut off two to three days earlier. And this being the Tuesday day, 24th of November, this meant that the leg was cut off from its body, uh, probably the earlier weekend. And now police had only this one leg without other body parts or even a name to this victim, which they concluded pretty 
early stages that was a murder victim. So yeah, but yeah, they just before you go on, um, they realized that it was a murder because of the way that the leg was cut. Uh, the cut or you know the point where it's coming off the body is actually was hacked. It wasn't cut with like a surgical knife. So they knew that it wasn't, let's say, like a doctor or a surgeon who removed it, but maybe someone who had more primitive household tools. The problem remained because they needed to start finding and recovering other parts of the corpse. And in order to do that, they had to basically calm this dump site. And they brought in the fresh recruits from police academy to start investigating this uh, site. And they were actually uh, withholding parts of the site so people couldn't bring their their uh, trash into this dump because it had to be investigated. They also had special dogs to find bodies. Uh, I believe they're called cadaver dogs or something like that. Mm-hmm. Canine units. Yeah. And they also posted stuff on the local medias that has someone gone missing or does somebody, someone know anything about anyone who might have gone missing without yeah. any results. And when they were checking out this dump... Uh, from what I remember, they searched something like one hectare, which took about two weeks. And then they also used the local military garrison officers or I guess conscripts there to secure the site in the evening so people wouldn't come and, you know, disturb it. Yeah, that's right. I, I believe that's was from Rihimäki Garrison that in the 1998 was a signal regiment. And uh, I believe Rihimäki is somewhere like 10 kilometers from Hyvinkää, so quite a near garrison site. I would presume that a dump site is such a difficult place to find any evidence. How would you even know what is evidence and what, what is trash? Yeah, and the other problem with this huge dump site is that the several nearby counties were bringing their waste this specific dump so it wasn't that the only people from Hyvinkää were using it wow you know it would make it really difficult to kind of pinpoint where exactly the victim came from or where this murder happened yeah i mean you uh, have millions of people literally in this south of finland to search through. But after a week, they got lucky because they happened to find a body part that would bring this uh, investigation forward. And I believe it was a stomach of this person. And with that stomach part or a piece, they could narrow down the victim's age to be somewhere around 20 to 30 years old. And they could confirm that it was indeed a John Doe. So victim was most definitely a male. Okay, and I guess also they ran some medical tests and they found that this person was actually abusing a lot of alcohol. It led to this that they could figure out that it was most likely that this person was some sort of a customer of social services. And they went after social services in a way that they started to check people who hadn't collected their uh, benefits checks from these services. So as a person familiar with these loca- this, with this location in that time, how would you describe the social economic demographic? Would you say that Huvinka was like a rich area or was it fairly you know, less wealthy, or how would you describe it? I think the, the middle class describes it pretty well. Hyvinkää region in general was a sort of a quiet place, of course. 
in 2010 there was this mass shooting when this crazy guy opened gunfire with a rifle to people coming from nightclub in the early hours of the Sunday morning. But it, as general, nothing too violent happened there in an everyday life. And of course, there were alcohol problem and alcohol abusers and youth was into metal music as well as in Rihmäki, because in those days there was a lot of underground bands and a lot of gigs happening all over the cities. And that was sort of a genre thing. But as myself being part of this genre, then no one, I, I never saw anything violent going on or anything threatening in that matter. Yeah, because I'm just talking about this because, you know, in our last case that we talked about from Huvinka, we talked about the Kyrta murders, which, you know, the guy was a wealthy lord. So it's, and that was only what, 20 years before this one. So, or 30 years. 25 so, approximately. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, definitely a huge contrast between these two different cases that happened in the same town. Or same area. A violent murders, but nothing to do uh, from the social, economical, class point of view with each other. And I don't think money itself played too heavy part uh, in either of these murders. But mm -hmm. as we knew, the police went after these social security checks or more so people who hadn't collected them and This led the investigation to Järvenpää, and from there they were on that right track. And later on, the DNA test confirmed this victim's identity, and this led to circle of his friends, to suspects. Let's dive into who these suspects were. Right. Suspects were people named... Jarno Sebastian Elk, who was self-proclaimed and uh, well-known Satanist amongst his friends and his circle. And I believe he was really to the point and adamant about that he didn't worship Satan and Satanism and Satan worshiping are like basically two different things that this Satanism, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's all about the individual right to do as one pleases. That you are your own god and no laws of other deities will uh, tie you down or can tell you what to do. Well, I don't really know much about Satanism. Um, I would also think that it's worshipping Satan. Uh, but I do know about this case, and you are right that that's what Jarno Elg was thinking. And I think that was also a lot of the reason why he did or why he behaved in a certain way. You know, quite carefree, let's say. The next uh, suspect was Tervi Johanna Tervashonka who was a bit younger to Jarno Elk, who was a sort of a pact leader, ringleader, if you will. And this Tervashonka was uh, actually living in this Jarno Elk's apartment in Hyvinkää. And they were, at least according to our sources, heavily talking about and philosophizing about this Satanism and, and all of this darkness in one's mind during their friendship. Which, you know, is very interesting because uh, some sources I was reading about this said that this Tervi Tervas Honka was described as a fairly quiet to normal person by her family. And that she wasn't really into this kind of stuff. It was only when she met him that she began being in this occult and Satanism and these kinds of beliefs. Hmm. That's actually quite interesting. And did they meet in this Kelokoski mental asylum? 
You know, I think you're right that they met at Kelokoski Hospital. So then there was this unnamed 20-year-old guy from Mansala. Mansala is quite close to Hyvinkää and uh, he was also present during these events. And then a fourth guy, unnamed 16-year-old kid from Kerava and Kerava is approximately same distance from Hyvinkää than these other places. So all of these people were from close by counties. And from what I remember, the 16-year-old, I think, uh, had some mental challenges. What kind of mental challenges are you talking about? Well, I don't know specific illnesses, but um, certain sources said maybe he was more easier influenced, uh, maybe a bit slower than the other people there. Okay, I didn't know that one, but what I do know is that Police arrested all of these four suspects already on the 8th of December of the same year. So the body parts were found, or the body part was found 24th November, and the arrest was made 8th of December. So I I, I think it was pretty fast work from police in a case that you only had a leg in the beginning. Yeah, that's actually very commendable work. You know, I'm sure a lot of people were sleeping better at night knowing that these four were in police custody. Let's talk about these events and this ringleader himself, who was this 23-year-old Jarno Elk. And he knew all of these suspects and he knew this victim too. A little bit about Elk's history in 23 years of his age he had already been a busy boy with a life of crime at the age of 16 he was convicted of burning down a middle aged church at Kirkonumme oh wow that I didn't know that's actually a shame such an old church and he ruined it this was seven years roughly before so around 1991 right Yeah, it looks to me. I'm I'm not sure, of course, and these documents don't talk about it. But uh, it looks like this church burning happened after a similar uh, cases happened in Norway, and the Norway in the black metal scene. There were a lot of church burnings and and a murder uh, done by Vark Vikernes, who then helmed a band called Bursum which is a legendary black metal band. And I think that church burnings were inspiring this elk, but that's just me here. None of our material actually confirms it. I would say it's a good suspicion on your part. Um, it can give us kind of a good idea of already that he was heading down this very dark path from a very young age. And, you know, I do understand when you're 16, you're easily influenced and everything you see, especially in this kind of a metal scene. I mean, I grew up as an emo kid, so, you know, it was a bit of different scene, but it was still with this sad kind of dark moods and, you know, it fits well as a teenager, but a lot of people grow out of it and they certainly don't go around burning churches. Well, I can guarantee that most of the genre people have nothing to do with any criminal life. It's music or a sort of a lifestyle or a philosophy, but not in physical physical way. But yeah, as we spoke about, this guy was huge into Satanism already when he was young. And now back to 1998, Friday, 20th of November... Uh, these five people, victim and four suspects, were hanging and getting drunk at Järvenpää. They went to this Pentecostal church that had a tea hall, and they were there debating patrons about Christianity and, you know, hackling and, and trying to prove their case. Yeah, and I guess if they were 
drinking that would have had a lot of confidence to heckle people. I heard that they were drinking some kind of a homemade moonshine made from sugar. Yeah, I think it's it's this uh, kill you that you're mentioning, uh, mm-hmm. fucking horrific Finnish drink that you manufacture yourself and taste like shit to me. <laughs> But how strong would you say that kill you is normally? It's somewhere around 15 to 17 percentage. I guess it depends how you manufacture it and how well do you do it. Uh, but I can assure you, no matter how well you do it, you can't get it to taste anywhere near good. Well, I guess then that uh, these, this group was just looking for a good time, not a good taste. Well, this time did not turn good for the fifth guy, our unnamed victim. They took their party from the Pentecostal Tea Hall to Jarno Elk's place at Hyvinkä, and they were listening this the Kenyan Chronicle album, which uh, basically described the the path of Cain since his brother's murder reimagined by the band Ancient. And they were getting drunk even more. And at some point, this elk got really aggravated by this victim. And he punched that guy straight in the face. So hard that the guy blacked out. And it turned into some sort of a scuffle where all of these three other people joined in and started to beat the living shit out of this guy. At some point, he had a collar and a leash on and he had to act like a dog. These people urinated on this guy and... This Tervas Honka, who apparently got annoyed of bleeding for his life. This Tervas Honka taped his head and his mouth so he couldn't yell. I also believe that somebody stabbed this guy in the head with a pair of scissors that they found. This is uh, really horrific stuff. I mean, from what I know is what they taped the whole head i mean how of course i haven't seen any pictures of this murder but do you think that they taped the head like around like this because i know he couldn't breathe from it yeah uh i believe at least they taped his nose and his mouth because the cause of death according to the police investigation was suffocation, not the stab wounds in the head and apparently all over his body that came from the scissors. Yeah, and you know, that's really crazy because they did stab him over and over and over and punching and whatnot. As I said, this is one of the most horrific murders that I have heard has happened in Finland. And uh, the detective Ari Soronen, who was investigator here claimed that there was even cannibalism and necrophilia involved with the case but the elk in the end of the day denies this although he was the one who put these rumors to spread he boasted about what they did to his other friends and he said that he was trying to scare them how crazy or how like powerful he is when he was eating this guy. Probably this is one of the reasons why why the case was solved so quickly that, you know, he couldn't keep his mouth shut, which for us is a good thing that they could have catch him so quickly. Yeah. Um, let's go back to this murder evening. At some point they realized that this guy had died and There is some sources that claim that that wasn't the end game. But of course, when you think with your brain, when you treat person like this, of course, he's going to die. For me, it's just the most crazy thing to think that these young people are capable of such things. And then, you know, they also just throw their life away because you can't really come back from such a crime. 
you're a criminal for life. Yeah, how can you? It's a probably a traumatizing thing and uh, alters your life path for good in most cases. Uh, so uh, they discovered the guy had died and they had a corpse there in the apartment. The elk decided that the best way of getting rid of the problem was to cut the victim into pieces and dump the body parts in the different trash cans. No one can track nothing or anything to him and his circle of friends. But as we know, that's not the case and police caught them 8th of December. So next year, 1999, the trial took place at the district court of Hyvinkää. Public and media were all over this case and it was a quite horrific one for Finnish audiences too. And, and it is said that the most hard-boiled criminal journalists, they were gasping their breath and had to take breaks when they were reporting about this uh, trial. And this ringleader, this Jarno Elk, uh, acted a bit similar way than this person that I mentioned murdered a fellow band member in Norway earlier years, this Vark Vigernes who was trialed and convicted two of the murder. And in the same manner, this guy was smirking to the cameras, this Jarno Elk, in his trial, he was showing middle fingers and, you know, the horns to the cameras. So he was looking like he would enjoy of all of this attention and he was acting like a proud fellow. And what did he have to be proud of? This kind of horrific crime that, you know, even shocked the most hardened journalists. But, you know, it, I guess, showed his true colors. But maybe also he just didn't understand what was going on. But, or maybe he did understand. He just was on another planet altogether to what the reality was that he was the murderer of this horrific horrific crime if i would have to guess he enjoyed this attention somehow and he was this great satanist right so now he had done something according what the people in norway had done in the earlier years i would say that a person who is capable of this and with the past that he had he probably was a normal not by any means, at least if you ask me. The courtroom was cleared pretty soon, the media, and the trial was held, and the court declared most of the material to be sealed for 20 years. Yes, yes. So this is one of the reasons why only limited amount of information is available. But what we do know is what kind of sentences these people got, and this Jarno Elk was sentenced to life in prison. I think we talked about this before in the previous case that life in prison in Finland doesn't actually mean for life. It only means, what, 12, 16 years? Yeah, it's uh, usually around 16 years, 14 to 16 years when you can get out. Uh, I believe this guy was granted a parole somewhere around 2014. Okay, that's a very scary thought. It is, but what we also know that there is no reported crimes, at least not under the name of Jarno Sebastian Elk. So maybe he has gone straight. Well, let's hope. And what happened to the rest of the group? Unnamed 20-year-old got two years and eight months from aggravated assault and heinous acts against corpse and this heinous acts against corpse uh, i believe covers these mutilations and cutting it to pieces and uh, after he got out of the prison he had been found guilty of drunk driving but obviously he wasn't considered to be responsible of this murder yeah i think they probably thought he was just more of a bystander yeah accomplice i think is the word so this unnamed 16-year-old kid from Kerava, 
charges were dismissed by the court altogether and it was seen that he had been forced to take part of these crimes by this older ringleader Jarno Elk and this boy has not been sentenced of any crime but it was said that this guy was greatly influenced by this elk and was strongly influenced by Satanism at those days. Yeah, and, you know, if he did have mental challenges, I guess in a way he can't really fully be held responsible for what happened. I believe that the other people, even though they were drunk, they did know what they were doing, so they were held fully responsible. Although the elk got the longest sentence. And we still have this Terhi, Johanna Tervasonka, who got actually sentenced to eight and a half years of prison for a murder committed without full understanding and as a minor. That's really interesting that they convicted her that way because, you know, in other countries, for example, America, they would have maybe trialed her as an adult because of the severity of the crime, even though she was 16. Well, uh, Finland's justice system works a bit differently than the United States. In any case, she got paroled 2003. June 7, 2007, she gave some axe handling to this 47-year-old guy, more precisely to his neck, and that ended up causing the guy's death. And 2008, she was found guilty of murder. Hmm, no surprise there. And I guess this time she didn't have the excuse of being a teenager, so she got a longer sentence. Yeah, it's actually 10 years that she got out of this one. And uh, this was 2008 when she was convicted. But 2011, uh, July, summertime again, she escaped from Vanaya prison, which is this sort of an open prison type of thing where you do work tasks and you could move a bit more freely. Wasn't she working something with Park. She was working at uh, Puistotyöntekijä, so park, some sort okay, of a park. I, I think she was cutting the grass or renovating the the yards or something like that. I don't doubt that it's a very hard work in a hot condition, but for a convicted criminal, a double murder convicted criminal, that's a lot of freedom to give. That's that's correct. And uh, one thing to add here, she wasn't Tervasonka anymore, but she had changed her name to Tukio after she got paroled 2003. And when she got out of prison this time, I believe she committed one more crime at least. Well, uh, yeah, she forged a prescription and also committed theft. What do you guys think? Have you heard before about these crimes what do you think about such acts yourself please leave us a comment as always hit that subscription button and that notification bell so you won't miss any of our future episodes but we thank you and see you next week bye